Welcome again to Thursdays with Troy. As always, I'm Troy, Troy Lambert, mystery author, editor, super plotterer, and your host. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to writing teacher Daniel David Wallace. He completed his PhD in creative writing at the University of Tennessee, where he spent four years researching new ways to teach fiction writing. He is the editor-in-chief for Burlesque Press, the host of the annual Escape the Plot Forest writing conference, which is fantastic, by the way, and you should go. And his work has appeared in McSweeney's Internet Tendency, Tampa Review, Air Schooner, and Fiction Writers Review. His online classes have led aspiring and experienced authors alike to call him the novel whisperer and the literary midwife. He is sadly not the Daniel Wallace who wrote the novel Big Fish, nor is he the Daniel Wallace, MD of Boston, whose patients regularly email him requests for medication. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you so much, Troy. Well, since you often get mistaken for a doctor, I just have one question for you before you, we start. Does, does this look normal to you? I just, it's no, pretty I just serious. <laughs> It's pretty, I would, I would get that checked out. You're going to give me the WebMD answer. I know yeah. that you are. All right. Well, welcome. As most of you authors understand, the beginning of the novel, specifically those first few chapters, needs to be spot on. This includes traditional publishing, where these are the chapters the agent or editor sees before deciding to take your story on, or self-publishing, where the look inside on Amazon and these first three chapters really bring your reader into the story, and there it's a great sales tool as well. So, Daniel, tell us why do you feel the beginning of the novel is so critical? The things you said already are so true. Readers are trying to make a decision whether to keep reading, and editors or agents are looking at those opening chapters, like, do I want to work with this person? Does this person seem ready? Uh, they're kind of like a calling card for you if you're doing traditional publishing. I also think that from the writer's point of view, they're so important because we as fiction writers have so many things we're trying to work on. We've got to mention, you know, the character's brother and like we've got to, you know, talk about their painful, you know, ex, ex person who's haunting their dreams. <laughs> There's so much to get into. And I think that it's a, it can be a real challenge for fiction writers to figure out, okay, what am I actually focusing on? What am I trying to get the reader's attention? And I also think, last point, is that uh, sometimes I think that writing advisors, editors, teachers, whatever you want to call them, us, uh, don't realize how contradictory some of the advice sounds. Like, mm -hmm. it'll say, you know, um, uh, start, you know, media is in media res, start, you know, get the thing moving fast. Uh, but then it's also don't confuse the reader. Don't. Don't be uh, <laughs> right, right. furious. And those two things can often be in real real tension with each other. Right, exactly. I actually asked somebody a question like that just recently in an interview and said, hey, how confused should the reader be? And they're some, not confused at all, but you got to start fast. So you're absolutely right. Um, tell us briefly, we'll dive deep here in just a minute, the basic concept of the character's project and how that kind of came to you. So... What I, the advice, I, my solution to that problem that you just described, the reader is never confused. That's rule one, but you got to move fast. Is that what I encourage a lot of writers to do? It doesn't work for every kind of book. I want to be really clear. And it, it doesn't, it, and I think it's less useful as you get deeper into a series. But particularly if you're working on a book with us, one, the first in the series, or it's, it's, it's a standalone book. I really think that focusing on the character's project at the beginning, the thing the character wants and is trying to achieve is your solution to that problem. That mm -hmm. you are moving fast because stuff is happening to the character, but you aren't confusing the reader because you're not trying to explain the thousand years of magic that came before this. He's just trying to find right. his missing shoe or he's just trying to get promoted at work. Right. Exactly. That is actually, that is a brilliant and obviously very brief description um, of this. What sets this approach to starting your novel apart from, let's say, another method? That's a, that's a great point. A uh, great question. And sometimes people ask me methods that do sound like mine and I get, I get nervous for a bit. It's, it's a scary moment. But um, I think that one of them is that I think it is not always a good idea 
and you may disagree, you may, you may come to blows about this, Troy. <laughs> but I, th I don't encourage people to think about in terms of the inciting incident. I think that in screenwriting, where you have Brad Pitt on screen looking great and people like watching him, it, it makes sense to sort of show him sort of meandering through life for a bit. But when I read novels, success, really successful novels, it's not really that there is, the, the main character is in sort of like ease and comfort for five pages or so. It's more that they are already on the move. Like, just as you said, there is no kind of delay. They are already on the move. They're trying to do something. It's just that it's something that to them seems kind of simple. Mm -hmm. And so the example I would give is like, uh, in the classic novel, The Age of Innocence, uh, the, the protagonist starts the novel on page one, like about to, de to declare his engagement to his future wife. There's not like five pages where he warms up to that. And I think that what happens when people, when writers try to sort of like use that logic, even if it's a good piece of advice in general, is that I find that then all kinds of other stuff get sort of like comes in as if through a vacuum. Like the vacuum sucks in all this stuff about like world building, backstory, extraneous exactly. characters, uh, as if to sort of fill the pages. And I think that that's like the wrong approach for a lot of novels. So would you say that comes down to the showing versus telling aspect of is show me your world as normal. Don't tell me about it. Hmm. That kind of is that kind of that's kind of what you're saying, right? That's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Like you want to see this character doing something which and this is important, like to them is a challenge. They are not right. just going to collect the laundry. And we get, we get to like as they get to laundry, we see like outside the window and we see them. It's to them. To them, they are already in a story, and they're already kind of like anxious, nervous. Um, they're out of their comfort zone, and they are trying to do something that is like they have maybe haven't done before. And this is all on page one. An example would be, if I can keep going. Oh, you so, like, so the very first Jack Reacher novel is like a wonderful example of this, that what he thinks he is doing is sort of traveling America, going to these sort of odd places in particular, going to this strange little town that he's never been to before to find a, an obscure news about an obscure musician. And that that could be, for some people, all the novel. Like that right. could yeah. be, it would write kind of a dull novel, maybe, I don't know, depending on the, the person's skill, but that could be the novel. He's just wrong about this. He doesn't realize that, you know, He's about to get arrested, and it's all things are about to go downhill from there. And he's got something else to do. He's not just going to take the video back to to Blockbuster. He is um, he's trying something that's a challenge, and I think that's a, a crucial crucial part of it. That's exactly what I think we want to lead into. Is basically the protagonist begins a story in opposition to the real plot. So I think we're already talking about what this means to you, but describe that concept for us briefly from. From your point of view, how is the character's project at the beginning in opposition to the real plot? Like, let's use that Jack Reacher example and just let's talk about, uh, and we're, we're ma obviously making some assumptions and if you haven't read the first Jack Reacher novel, first of all, go do it. If, you, if you've only barely started it, minor spoiler alerts, we won't give away the whole plot, but go ahead. Yeah. What I think is that, and this, I'm gonna describe it from the writer's point of view, because I think the people in the room right. are writers is that uh, what I think a lot of writers do is they underestimate in, in a lot of successful books how much the main character resists getting into the story, the real plot of the story, and how long that takes. And I think that a lot of writers have this kind of feeling of like, okay, well, they'll discover it. But often I'll be talking to a writer and they'll, they'll say something like, and then the character decides to learn about the ancient cyborg wisdom. And I, and I want to say, like, in a lot of successful novels, you're, you're talking about something that happens at, like, the 50% point of the book or the 75% of the point of the book, not, like, page 10. Right. That, that your character should hate cyborg wisdom for, like, a large portion of the story unless you're trying to do something different or it's, like, you know, book 10 of the series and it's a different kind of thing. And with Jack Reacher, 
he really does not want to find out what is going on in this town. And there's a great scene, I'm, it's not a spoiling, but where he's basically like stuck with someone else and the guy's like, I'm going to tell you exactly what is happening. And Jack Reacher says, don't. Do not tell me. I don't want to hear it. I, I don't, don't want to learn. It. Leave me alone. And the guy kind of babbles a bit, but he obviously is not telling the story. He, he could be about, you know, a different writer, a weaker writer, would have then just given us a whole bunch of exposition. But Jack Reacher says, nope, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Yep, exactly. Kindle or Kobo is a really good way to read these books because you can see when these moments happen and it will tell you like percentage points. And it's not until I think people can check this, but it's not until like the quarter mark of the book, 25% of the way through, that Jack Reacher says, I'm going to figure out who these people are and I'm going to do something bad to them. But he doesn't know what, even at that point, he doesn't know what they're doing. He has no actual information about what's happening. And I don't think he even starts to get that sense you know, until we're about halfway through the book. Right, exactly. Well, that's a fantastic example. Well, let's get into, I know you kind of had a presentation, but let's we can maybe speed through parts of that. We'll see how what you've got and things like that. I'll ask you questions along the way. And then we'll kind of get into using Plotter to do exactly what you're talking about. So go for it. Go ahead and share your screen and I'll ask you questions along the way. Let me Great. add it up here. Great. So... Troy, your questions are so fantastic. You've already kind of like, um, you know, got the basic picture. I'm just going to go through some slides to sort of try to clarify what I mean and and maybe fill in some other elements of this. I'm going to skip some of these questions. Uh, and I think the first thing I would just encourage is that sometimes I hear people say, you know, your protagonist should only have one unshakable goal, like that that's like a key thing in a protagonist. But as you can see from our conversation so far, that's just not the case with, say, Jack Reacher. And I think it's not the case with like a lot of protagonists. That when we meet them, they already have a goal. They're trying to get it. And the drama of the beginning of the novel, or even the first half of the novel, is seeing them slowly sort of change their mind. And that, But that takes a very long time. If we have enough time, Troy, I'll just give my rather um, fancy example from Shakespeare. <laughs> You know, um, we sometimes forget that, or there's a theory about Shakespeare, that one of the reasons why the tragedies are so good is all the tragic heroes are in the wrong play. And the example, an easy example is, if Macbeth were in Hamlet's play, the whole play would take about 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> Macbeth, you know, Macbeth is told the rightful king has been murdered. Here's who you have to kill to, to deal with it. It's not going to take Macbeth more than a morning to get the whole thing wrapped up. And that would not be a fun play to watch. And it's similarly the case with Othello, with Hamlet, that they're just sort of in the wrong story. And that was what makes them such good protagonists. Similarly, the Jack Reacher who's eager to figure out what's going on in this town is less compelling than the one who doesn't want to hear about it. Okay. And a book, if people are interested, a contemporary book that I think is takes this almost too far. Like it's such a good example of what I'm talking about that maybe it's some people find it like annoying because is Gideon the Ninth. I rec if you haven't read this book, I really recommend it. And it really does show you that you can delay the protagonist finding out what's going on or even caring about what's going on for a really long time. And, you know, I was looking at my Kindle, reading it, and it's like, I was sort of shocked. Like, my God, we're 75% of the way through the book, and she's only just figuring out blank? It's kind of an amazing <laughs> example. And the point of that, the point of bringing this up is, when we meet Gideon in Patch Chapter 1, her goal is to run away from home and join the army. She has this whole plan to do it, and she is basically, literally dragged into the main plot by this other character. And it takes her a really long time to sort of figure out what's happening and to even sort of pay any attention to it or care about it. And I think that makes her a com incredibly compelling protagonist. You know, this is, we already mentioned Jack Reacher. Um, and this is kind of the bigger picture, Troy. Maybe we could talk about this in a second. Is that I really think that writers are sometimes misled by their our own memories. You know, if I ask you about a book that you really love, Troy, and you tell, start telling me about it, almost certainly you will be telling me about 
the stuff that happens in like almost all of it will be in the second half of the book. The cool parts, the battles, the the revelations, the stuff you understand of the book after you've read it. But the this is misleading to us as writers because when we were reading the book, we didn't actually know any of that stuff. We didn't know about the conspiracies. We didn't know, we didn't have any battles maybe at the beginning. All we were doing was following a person around. And we liked that person and we saw them struggling. And it's that that drew us into the story. And that's what like sort of, I don't want to say got us through the first few chapters because it wasn't a struggle to get through them. That's what brought us into the tale. Right. It led us through the first few, few chapters, not necessarily... We weren't pushed through. We didn't have to force our way through. We were just led through because we were interested. Yeah. Um, you know, it goes back to some of the things I was going to ask you about is basically right. examples of this different thing. And we've talked about getting, we've talked about Jack Reacher. We've even talked about Shakespeare, um, which hopefully some of these things are resonating with people. And also different, there's different story structures that use this exact type of thing. If you look at romancing the beat, you really, until you're about 25, 30% through, the romance isn't really even happening. Again, if you talk about a romance book or any kind of a book that uses that type of template that you really loved, you're absolutely right. You'll remember the stuff from the last part of it. So walk us through how you perform this character's project. How do, how do you actually use that to start a story? Oh, okay. <laughs> here's what I here's how you use it. What I would suggest to everyone tr is that the character, but I think that it's a really good idea to come up with something that the character is focused on when we meet them and which they can pursue in those opening chapters. And this is where some people get this wrong. They think that what I'm saying is like the character should want things. And that's not really what I'm getting at. Of course, the character should want things. But the point is that that whatever the character's focus is, that that's what the opening chapters are about. We're not watching someone sort of dream about, I don't know, moving to Spain, and then on page two, they get invited to become you know, a super, super agent. <laughs> it's rather that they have some kind of opening or threat, opportunity, chance to do the thing they want, and they're taking it. And so we're watching them sort of pursue their mission in the opening scenes, chapters, however you plan your story. And what we're also doing is that as they do this, we're dropping hints that something bigger is going on. And those hints will get more and more obvious, compelling, emotionally involved for them as, this, as the story develops. So that by the time you get to like that 20, 25% of the way through the story, they are now ready to make this kind of choice to pursue this, this other thing that's, that's depicted on the front of the book and the back cover. Can I show you this next part? Yes, absolutely. And so this, of course, is Plotter. And what I've got here is chapters. I sometimes rewrite this when I'm working with people, and I'll, I'll do this with just scenes because it doesn't always have to be chapter by chapter, but this would just imagine is a fairly short chapter, I would say. But that what you're watching in chapter one is the character trying to do this thing, their project. And hints from various ways, I don't know, stray lines of dialogue, clues that don't add up, odd comments, you know, an interesting tarot card reading, that there's something bigger going on. What we see usually is that the character is not succeeding to do the thing they want, that their project is like, in a sense, not working. And that's why I talk about these failures. They're trying to get to pass the audition to join the, the dancing club in their town, and they're not succeeding. As they do this, they're picking up this sort of information that like there are vampires in the town terrorizing people and they need to figure out a way to defeat them but we're watching them make this progress and they're not succeeding to do it. Right, so in your example where the person is trying to move to Spain, let's say as the first chapter, really what the important thing would be is that something stops them from moving to Spain and maybe that something is then a hint at our real plot. Mm -hmm. 
That'd be a good example. Yeah, I think that different stories will handle the interconnection between these elements slightly differently. It might be that the character is just sort of destined to fail at this thing, and they start to realize, wait a second, if I learn about the cyborg wisdom, that will help me get to Spain. And that's kind of like a way th through. Other times, it's like the, the sort of evidence piles up that there's something bigger amiss and they have to kind of turn their attention to it. A good example of this is, you know, the first Harry Potter novel, which remains a good example of plotting. It, Harry Potter's got this very clear goal once he's heading to wizarding school, which is to blend in, to be liked, to be popular. And what he keeps getting hinted at is that's not what he is, is going to happen, that he is instead deeply connected to this the, the Voldemort, and every time he gets these hints, he's horrified, disgusted, appalled, and he desperately tries to backtrack and get a, and sort of hope that this won't keep coming up. Similarly, like as Jack Reacher tries his best to like get out away from the police who think he's this murder suspect, more and more hints are piling up that something bigger and more dangerous is going on, and he's doing his best to ignore them while trying to get away and continue his rather. Uh, idiosyncratic quest from the start. Can I make one other comment, Troy, before I go on? You betcha. Sure, sure. So one thing to think about for the people watching this is one thing I love about Plotter is that you could have your sort of, like what many in many software things would be like, the outline on one line. So like scene one, what happens? So it could be that you could have this blue line would be just very quickly, like what is happening in this chapter, this scene? And then you could be tracking the other elements that I'm talking about in the other lines, the green and the red line. And I find that actually kind of useful. You're sort of brainstorming this way. You It can be kind of confusing. But if you sort of have like, okay, the character will do X, then they'll do Y, then they'll move on to the next thing. And then in each of those moments, I'm reminding myself, okay, he's trying to get his money back from the bank. But he keeps getting these hints that his mother was a cyborg. Plotter gives you a really nice way to keep track of these things. Yeah, it gives you a really great way to visualize it. Now, as far as the practical, kind of moving into the practical use of this, are, are there certain genres that you find that this works well with, certain ones that it doesn't? Are there any downsides to this method? I don't know if it's a downside, but what this method really works well for are novels that are relatively um, constrained in time, in space, and this is where writers get a little uncomfortable, in numbers of points of view. That if you accept my idea that the reader is trying to make contact with a, with a protagonist so they can make sense of the story, then the more protagonists you have it, it's and the more locations you have, the harder work it is for the reader to do this. And um, so, for instance, in our example of the character trying to move to Spain, you know, I would generally encourage a writer to like, we never get to Spain. Like, like we should, we can, we can kind of, <laughs> you know, we can start in Spain or we can not get there, but we probably shouldn't move to Spain halfway through. Uh, for certain kinds of epics, that's obviously not relevant. You've got other problems to deal with, other situations. You've got a thousand pages to work with. Uh, but I find this to be extremely useful for stories that involve um, the truth coming out. So, you know, urban fantasy, family dramas, it works well with romance. Uh, it works well with a kind of constrained fantasy novel where it's like we're following really like one or maybe two people around. It obviously works well too with the, um, the, the kind of police detective who's got one final case before they retire. They're, they're, what they think they're doing is different to what is about to happen to them. Right. So the quest or the epic journey might not be the easiest to use this for. Your epic science fiction or your epic fantasy might be a little bit more of a challenge for this type of approach. But I will say that if people, <laughs> if people like Brandon Sanderson's work, you can see his books behind me on my mm -hmm. bookshelf. The very first book of the Way of Kings saga, it's a thousand pages long. And it has two prologues. They have a series of different magical swords all going around. It's There's lots of magical stuff. 
But once we get to chapter like one, where we meet the protagonist, it is remarkable that Sanderson stops giving us magical swords for hundreds of pages. And instead we see yeah. two people trying to do a project. One guy is trying to just escape this, survive this slave convoy he's got trapped in. And the other is trying to get a job with a very intimidating woman. And we watch them doing that for a very long time. Only after we've got through what for most not writers would be an entire novel of pages, does Sanderson start bringing in these magical swords again? And so you can do this very, it's very effective. It's just, you need a lot of pages to work with. I do love the simplicity that you have here. Now, as far as for someone who's more of a discovery writer, is this something they can use kind of in the rewriting process to kind of bring what they've already written and figure out, is this working this way? Um, how could somebody that's a discovery writer potentially use this? It's hard to say because like everyone's revision process is, is kind of different, but looking at moments where you've, you've been writing for a while and trying to look back at the beginning and saying, am I writing some of these revelations, these reveals, this information about the story for myself so I figure out the story? Or am I, am I, is this like really the story that I wanted to tell? Because often what we do as writers is that we write for ourselves for a long period of time. So we say to ourselves like, oh, the character has a brother. Let's write a scene where he goes to visit the brother. Um, there's magic, so let's have someone explain magic to us early on. And we're kind of doing that for ourselves a lot of the time so we understand it. And so what I would encourage that person to do is look at stuff and say like, you know, very clearly, I'm not saying the kill your darlings thing. I'm saying, can we push this forwards into the book? Can we take some of is would it be possible to stick that later in the story, uh, maybe like 50 pages later? And and if, if we did that, could we have more time for the thing the character was trying to do at the start? That's actually brilliant. So I'm going to ask you another couple of questions. Do you have like a certain template that you put this up against as far as like a plot structure? Or do you recommend that people just add these as timelines into, if we share the screen again here, um, that people add these two things as timelines into whatever type of plot structure they're using? Uh, that's a great question. I do have an approach where I am trying to show writers how to tell their story character first. And so this kind of approach continues the whole way through the novel. As the story develops, it's not so much that the character is ignoring or hostile to the main plot, but rather it's more that they are underestimating it or they don't grasp what's really going on. And so as we sort of go through the middle of the book, we're watching them sort of do their best, but they're not doing enough. And they're, or they're not fully understanding like what will happen when they do this next thing. But I, but I think that it's definitely possible to, to sort of weave these elements into a lot of different stories, particularly at the start. And I think that sometimes, I think with some kinds of plots, with some kind of plot structures that are, well, that are kind of well known, you can kind of fall in a little bit to episodic telling of like, okay, now we'll have this scene where the two characters meet again. And, and I think that kind of coming back to this idea of like, what does the character think is going on? What are they trying to achieve in this scene? But what's like coming down the road for them is a nice way to kind of get it back. So you're really like telling a story and not just say like creating another, I don't know, meet cute scene that you feel like, you know, you need to create. Right. So I think that, that's actually a really good point to kind of lead into is that obviously your stuff is very character driven. Um, and it, this is a, clearly a very character driven plot, um, which is plot style, which is absolutely, I absolutely love that. Well, one more question. Do you, how, how does this approach help you? So you said it kind of continues throughout the whole novel, but is there a way that helps you transition from the beginning of the novel until when the character starts to integrate with the real plot when their project starts to maybe align with the real plot? Is there some kind of a, like a time frame, like a moment that that happens, or is there some kind of a transition that happens that you kind of recommend people use? 
I try to be inspired by the books I read. And I was really inspired by the first Jack Reacher novel. And I don't think this is particularly controversial. That I think that there's often a sort of moment around, I guess, like the 15% percent portion of the book where the character decides or is sort of forced to, um, to start investigating the real story of the plot, but in a kind of reluctant, cynical, dismissive, amused way. And you can see this very clearly in Jack, the Jack Reach novel, that, that there's a sort of slow process where the character is now getting involved, but what they're telling them inter self internally is, I'm not actually doing this. Gotcha. Um, I think that if people want to, want to read a classic novel, um, The Age of Innocence is just a wonderful example of that, that Neil and Archer is like constantly telling himself, man, I hate that this other woman, my, my, my beloved cousin. Oh, she's so annoying. Why am I doing this? But he doesn't, the reader can see that he, and everyone else around him can see that he is getting into deeper and deeper trouble defending this woman against all comers and causing this enormous social um, disaster for himself, defending her. But at the same time, he's telling himself, ugh, like, I wish she would just get out, she would leave town. Then I think that in a lot of stories around, and, and I think that some other plot structures advise this too, around about the 20, 25% point of the book, we see another shift where the character is like, one way or another, is like emotionally getting committed to this, this, this thing. They maybe don't understand it. They, they maybe have misunderstood how serious it is, but now they're actually going to try and do something about this. Right. Something drives them into it. Well, okay. So any last things, any last thoughts that you want to share with us about the character project and this character plot method? Well, I have um, a little exercise that I love to share with people that I, if I could share and it is like an interactive prompt. I've created these to help me be a better teacher of writing because I love the people to sort of actually get moving. And it's sort of this prompt is meant to sort of talk you through these questions of like, who is your protagonist? And then what's something they're trying to do? Like, you know, they want to move to Spain. Okay. And so this prompt talks you through the, the kind of sort of the idea of the project and trying to work out, okay, how am I going to weave that together? If you want to use it for your book, you can. Well, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing that with us. I really appreciate that. Um, and usually at this point, I ask what other resources, clearly you have a PhD, you have a lot of education behind your name, um, but what other resources have really helped you get to the point where you are now as far as writing, teaching, and just learning about writing? There's a great book, which I don't recommend anybody else read unless you really want to go for it. It's a great book called Reading for the Plot. And it's one of those books that when you're reading in a PhD, you read all these kind of books all the time. They're, they're dense. They talk about Freud. And, you know, I was kind of getting work, sort of slugging, you know, slogging my way through the book. But then there was this moment he talks about the turning point of the whole novel of Great Expectations. And he talks about how when a character returns, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm not going to give the edit away. I don't know why. But yeah. when a, a major character returns, it shifts everything that our protagonist believed about himself. The whole idea of he had great expectations, he realizes he didn't. And it's this horrifying moment. And the one thing that the writer, Peter Brooks, talks about is that all those elements that he were there all along, it's not like the, the writer pulled a fast one on us. We were being shown over and over again, this is not what you think it is, Pip. You are mistaken that you think you're about to become this rich guy and be fancy and live in London and marry the woman you, you, you say you think you're in love with. We keep being told that's not going to happen. And our protagonist keeps ignoring it. And so it's like, and the example that Peter Brook gives is like a hidden part of the story just rises up in that moment. And I really like that for me, that was really powerful because it also told me like, I think a lot of people tend to divide novels into like serious novels, literary novels, mm -hmm. you know, classic novels versus new ones. And it really made me think like, no, this is happening in all kinds of good fiction that we're seeing things like the story was there all along. We just weren't seeing it because we were following Pip very closely and we sort of trusted him more than we should have. And 
but and for Pip, it was there all along too. And it was just a really, that was a really powerful moment. That's excellent. That's absolutely fantastic. So tell us where people can find you. Uh, tell us about your upcoming summit, which I'll be happy to see you there. Um, so tell us about that and tell people where they can find you online. Okay. So I, my, my, I have a blog and website, danieldavidwallace.com. It is, it's my name.com. And if you go there, you can see a full free course in how to write a short story using the character first method. And it's got 12 parts, there are prompts. It's all kinds of, it's all kinds of interesting email stuff behind the scenes. And that's free. Uh, it's worth checking out. So check out my website. It, another passion of mine is talking about writing style and trying to figure out how do we incorporate into our writing process. And a long time ago, I wrote some essays about writing style and they got picked up on Reddit. They, they kind of blew up. And so I've always been just continuing to research it. But it's great. My last event, we had like 3,000 registered attendees and it was wonderful. And Troy was great and Ryan was great. So um, I, I think mean, this event will be just as great, just as good. That is absolutely fabulous. Well, as you know, if you've watched Thursdays with Troy before, we always have a question of the day, which is top secret, and we never reveal it until the very end. Um, but since you enjoy short stories, and I've actually asked this question before, but I want to get your opinion because we'd like to get more than one author's opinion on these things. So I'm going to ask you a very important life question, and, and this one is about uh, pizza. So... There, there are a couple different styles of pizza. There's New York style pizza, which is kind of the foldable, portable Kindle type of pizza. And there's the Chicago style deep dish of pizza, which is like the Brandon Sanderson novels behind you. It's meaty, filled with good stuff, very heavy, but you could injure yourself if you're reading it in bed at night and fall asleep. So your preference, Kindle pizza or Sanderson pizza? Oh, that's tough because I, 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 I... I've got to say that I that I went to New York City on uh, with my family before the pandemic began, and I would love to go back. So I'm going to ignore the literary um, parallels here <laughs> and say that I really would like some New York pizza. <laughs> and All right, that is that is a fantastic answer. Thank you for being here with us, and again. Thanks everyone for joining us. Every Thursday we have a talk with a different author about different ways that they use Plotter different methods. We hope that you've really enjoyed this one. And you can always find myself and Daniel David Wallace all over the place. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And we'll see you next time.